Now the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. In the first chapter of Mark. Now I don't know how many of you guys are or have been privy to the book that Bob and John are working on. And this is a book, the definitive history of the Church of Holy Trinity, Dulwich Hill. Uh, I can tell you, having read some of the drafts of the early chapters, uh, it promises to be an absolutely scintillating publication. Uh, I mean, I, I'm often depicted as one of the more flamboyant and colourful characters in the ecclesiastical scene in Sydney, but I can assure you that I pale in comparison to some of my predecessors here and clergy who've been associated uh, with this congregation in days gone by. People like James Clark and George Chambers and Diggs Latouche. I mean, you'll see the portraits of these people near the front door when you walk into the church building. And in fact, there's a window here, a stained glass window dedicated to Diggs, which Bob's pointing out to us uh, right there. You can look at after. Diggs was never actually one of the rectors here, but he was a very popular preacher here, despite his French name. He was a fiery Protestant Irishman, gifted preacher and theologian. And who interestingly was referred to in his obituary in, in the Sydney Morning Herald as the Fighting Patra. <laughs> January 22nd, 1916. Thank you, Bob, for that reference. Uh, the, the title was associated with Diggs' action in World War I, of course. I mean, for those who don't know the story, Diggs felt irresistibly drawn to enlist when the Great War broke out. Uh, so drawn that even when he was refused position as chaplain, possibly because the diocese didn't want him to go, uh, he enlisted as a private. Got shipped off to Gallipoli. Um, apparently he had a bit of a premonition that he wouldn't survive. He gave away his entire theological library before he left. But I doubt if even he knew how quickly it was going to happen. Apparently no sooner did he disembark at Gallipoli than he was thrown straight into an assault and no sooner did he put his head above the par parapet than it got shot off. Uh, friends who heard of his death hadn't even realised it arrived. Now I was reminded a little of Diggs by today's gospel reading, primarily on the count of the speed at which everything seems to descend into chaos. Once the Sabbath arrives, Mark says, immediately Jesus found the synagogue and started preaching, and immediately some screaming crazy man stands up and starts heckling and harassing. And it's this, this sort of immediacy that really characterises Mark's Gospel. But it does reflect the impression that the Gospel writer had that once Jesus entered the fray, the violence started to escalate very quickly, as it did for poor old Diggs. But from the very moment Jesus arrives on the scene, he's stirring up trouble. I mean, that, that should not surprise us, I suppose. It should also not surprise us, I suppose, that that trouble starts in the middle of a worship service. I mean, Jesus was preaching in the synagogue, we're told, and it seems that the disturbed man begins his tirade during Jesus' sermon. We're not used to that sort of thing here, of course. It's a very bad sign, I think. I mean, I've been here almost 25 years now, and yet to be heckled. I'm not suggesting anyone starts. I mean, people are generally very quiet here during the sermons, aren't they? I mean, we did have one dear old soul, who Jan, remember, who made quite a lot of noise talking to herself. Well, she was completely deaf. Particularly if the sermon went on for a bit, she'd become quite loud. But uh, that does, uh, yeah, stamping the feet too. That's right. Anyway, dear old Jan's no longer with us. And we wouldn't call that heckling. She certainly, she wasn't standing up and screaming at the preacher as this guy was. It's a bad sign it doesn't happen here though, I think. Is, is it, um, surely the fact that the sick and the mentally ill and the spiritually unwell gravitated towards Jesus and couldn't felt, help but feel conflicted in his presence reflects the fact that as Mark said, Jesus had authority 
And they knew that wherever Jesus was preaching, that was the place you'd go to have your issues resolved. I mean, the showdown in Mark's Gospel is, is as brief as it is spectacular. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. That's it. It's a bit like watching you know, a showdown between Clint Eastwood and some nameless gun-slinging punk who's been hired to take him out. You know, we know who's going to win long before the pistols are drawn. The standoff between Jesus and the demon the synagogue ain't going to be big enough for the two of them. And we know which one of them is going to have to leave. I mean, the whole scene goes pretty much as we might have expected, right up to the point where we get the reaction from the crowd. Mark says, they were all amazed. No surprises there. And then he goes on to say, so they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching? What the? What is this? A new teaching? That is not what we would have said, is it? A bit lame, in fact. I mean, it's amazing we would have said, adding whatever expletives grabbed our imagination at the time. This is spiritual authority in action. This is more like it. This is the guy we've been waiting for. All of the above, perhaps, but a new teaching? I don't think so. I mean, surely there's a bit more going on here than a new teaching. Now, I know I'm a bit biased at this point because the very word teaching in this context is a sort of trigger word for me that reminds me of everything I don't like about my own church tradition. Anyone who's been part of the Sydney Anglican Diocese for any length of time knows that we, we as a whole take pride in our good teaching if you've ever been to gatherings of Sydney Anglicans, you'll know this is how individuals and parishes are assessed in our tradition. What's the teaching like in your parish? They will ask in order to gauge whether your church should be taken seriously. I mean, this, this bothers me a lot. You know, no one ever asks, what's your parish doing to stop the war? Or are the poor and the needy benefiting from the work of your parish? No, it's always, what's the teaching like? You remember where John the Baptist sent people to Jesus to assess his godliness and credentials? Are you the one who is to come or do we wait for another? What did Jesus say? Go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. I mean, if John's delegation had been made up of delegates from the Sydney Diocese, they wouldn't have been satisfied with that, would they? They would have said, what about your teaching? I mean, it's easy, because perhaps the congregation at Capernaum was sort of worse than the Anglicans, or protos of the Anglicans of, uh, of some sort, because their interest does seem to be with Jesus' teaching. Unless you think their response, what is this in your teaching, is some sort of poor translation. Uh, take a look at the King James Version. What is this? A new doctrine. A new doctrine? I mean, doctrine is the sort of thing doctors of theology work on as they try and put creeds together that distinguish the two natures of Christ or the triune nature of God. All very useful, but hardly hands-on ministry. And so we don't ask doctors of theology how many sick or possessed people they think they've healed through their work. Just as we don't ask someone who performs miracles what doctrine they've been working on before they were interrupted. Doctrine and healing, theory and praxis, and all the opposite ends of the spiritual spectrum, aren't they? We have teachers and academics at one end, doing their important, but inevitably boring work of analysing the minutiae of scripture and tradition, while healers, deliverers, freedom fighters, and pulpit-pounding preachers are at the other more dynamic end of the spectrum. And yet, you get the feeling here that in the minds of those who saw Jesus, that distinction didn't really exist. What is this? A new teaching? 
At the very least, least, we would have to say that the question reflects the fact that however else Jesus' contemporaries understood him, as a social activist, as a troublemaker, as a spiritual guru, or as a miracle worker, uh, they also saw him as a teacher. And indeed, if you look at the many titles attributed to Jesus and the many ways in which people refer to him in the New Testament, the most common title he was given was in fact rabbi, meaning teacher. What is this? A new teaching? I mean, that's the great question posed in the first chapter of this, the earliest published gospel. And the truth is, it was a new teaching. It was indeed. I'm not wanting to exaggerate the gap between Old and New Testaments or suggesting that the message and preaching of Jesus was disconnected from the teachings of the priests and prophets who went before him. Even so, there was something entirely fresh and different and unmistakably new in the teaching of Jesus. And that was obvious to everybody who encountered him. What was the new teaching of Jesus? I mean, personally, I think it can be summed up in three words. You are loved. This is, the, this is the new teaching that supplements the old teaching that all good children go to heaven. You'll forgive me if I'm oversimplifying things, but I don't think so you need to overcomplicate them either. The new teaching that we are loved replaces the old, or at least to say it supplements the old. That all good children go to heaven by assuring us that God has, the, has a place for us bad children as well. And this is the new teaching of Jesus. And, and simple as it is, it has power. This new teaching has power to heal, has power to drive out demons, has power to cure shattered minds, to mend broken hearts, to stop wars, and to bring true comfort and peace to individuals and to communities and to nations. If only we had the ears to hear it. There was a poignant statement made by the great playwright Arthur Miller as he reflected on the latter part of his marriage to Marilyn Monroe. Fearing for her life as he watched their estrangement and her growing paranoia and dependence on barbiturates, he said, I quote, I found myself straining to imagine miracles. What if she were to wake and I were able to say, God loves you, darling, and she were able to believe it? How I wish I still had my religion and she hers. Good doctrine can be a powerful healing force. I mean, I love that saying that's often attributed to St. Francis, preach the gospel at all times, and if you have to, use words. And yet I'm conscious too that Jesus did use words. And that his words worked miracles. mentioned the book that Bob and John are working on, on the history of the parish. Another thing I learned from those drafts is that the walls of this church have indeed been no stranger to persons battling their own demons. Indeed, I mean, the very first rector of this parish, James Clark, struggled enormously amongst other things, was arrested in 1893 when he was found running naked through a paddock, shouting and carrying on. He was another fighting padre. Didn't win all of his battles. The truth is we don't win all the battles. 
we struggle, we fight, we rise and we fall. But the Word of God and the new teaching of Christ remains. May God have His blessing in reading His Word.